Good morning, everyone. Great to be gathered with you on this Sunday morning to worship our God, our Lord, our Savior, and uh, to do this uh, by the equipping of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Holy Spirit has given us the word uh, that we would grow in our knowledge of God, that we grow in love for God, intimacy with God. And uh, to this end, I ask that you would uh, take your Bible and open up to the book of Ephesians with me. Ephesians, and uh, this morning we are looking at chapter 4, and verses 1 to 6. And if I could ask you to stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's Word. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 1, thus says the Lord, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the reading of God's inerrant word. Let it be received and treasured that way. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for giving us your word. Your word is perfect. We know that your word is without error. We know that your word is also living and active, double than a, a two-edged sword. And by it, we ask that even now you would, as your word is spoken and explained, preached, that you would cut and divide by your word and sanctify us. We ask that by your word and spirit, you would incline our hearts to you, um, incline our hearts to you, soften our hearts toward you. And I ask that you would soften our hearts toward one another. Um, help us to understand uh, what you have to say to us this morning, and more than that, to treasure what you have to say and to respond in a right manner. For we ask in Christ's name, amen. So last Sunday, I mentioned that if the COVID-19 pandemic began in March 2020, then we've been in this thing for one year, eight months. Speaking generally of Canada, it seems that one of the fallouts of the last 20 months has been increased disunity. Over the last 20 months, I'm sure all of us have experienced, outside of the church, disunity over things like the effectiveness of masks, the safety of vaccines, the legality or constitutionality of various government restrictions. And I'm sure you have at times, as I have, seen people outside the church become angry and hostile even towards people with opinion, opinions different than their own. We've witnessed people trying to force their perspective on those who disagree with them. Um, and sometimes when coercive tactics have not worked, we've seen individuals censored or shut down, or shut out, or canceled, or threatened, or even fired. And those who disagree with this or that opinion have been frequently treated as if either they're the village morons or hateful villains even before they've been heard. It's quite something. I think in all of this, there's been a, a breakdown in communication, dialogue, if people listen at all to different perspectives, then oftentimes they listen not really to understand, but to rebuke and attack. Others just refuse to listen, although, of course, they're very quick to keep on speaking. So we've seen in our culture uh, an arrogant, impatient, unloving divisiveness. Speaking now of the church in Canada, we all know Christians with very different opinions about this pandemic. Uh, 
At the risk of misrepresentation or oversimplification, I would like to introduce to you one of them this morning. His name is Arnold. You probably don't know Arnold because he's fictitious. I've just made him up. But by the end of this service, you will know him quite well. Um, I'm just using him for illustrative purposes. Sometimes it's easier to talk about these things if we make it a little bit more objective. So Arnold is a brother in Christ, and he thinks this is truly a pandemic. He believes the statistics are accurate. He believes many doctors and nurses are feeling overwhelmed, others burnt out. Arnold has a friend who died because of COVID-related complications. He believes that biblically the government has not been out of line to impose most of the restrictions that it has, like masks, social distancing, and curfews. Arnold is in favor of vaccination, but he doesn't think anyone should be coerced into getting vaccinated. Uh, Arnold thinks that as a church, whenever we're gathered together, we should do whatever we can to, 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 to contain the spread of the virus in order to protect people and preserve lives. He wants to show love for his brothers and sisters in Christ by protecting them from a virus he believes could hurt them and unnecessarily shorten their lifespan. Arnold is not motivated really by fear of death, but really by love for others to protect their lives. And Arnold wants unbelievers who might be looking in to the church or visiting, perhaps on a Sunday morning, to see this loving care we have for one another and for them. Now, as another example, consider Olga. You've prob probably never met an Olga. You've certainly never met this one. I've also made her up. <laughs> <laughs> Olga is also a Christian who thinks there is not a pandemic. Or, if there is, it's not nearly as bad as our government has said. She's contemplated whether or not this is a planned demic. She's skeptical, skeptical of the statistics and whether or not the hospitals are, in fact, actually overwhelmed. She believes that, biblically, the government has, at times, overstepped its authority, especially by interfere, interfering in the affairs of the church and hindering its mission. She thinks the vaccines are probably harmful, so she's refused to be vaccinated. She's willing to wear a mask at church and social distance, but she is often frustrated by these rules because she thinks that they're keeping her from serving the Lord and others well. And what drives Olga, at least this Olga, is not a, a self-centered defiance of authority. Instead, like Arnold, what drives her is love for others. She wants to show love for her brothers and sisters in Christ through warm hospitality, which she believes requires unmasked face-to-face -face conversations and hugs and close togetherness. And she wants unbelievers, those who might be looking into the church or even visiting the church on a Sunday morning, to see that we love one another so much that we're willing to take the risk of getting sick just to embrace one another. So these are, this is Arnold and Olga. Now, please understand, I don't mean to say that Arnold is right and Olga is wrong, or vice versa. I'm not saying that at all, at least not this morning. Nor is my intention to misrepresent anyone, and I don't mean to say that every person here is either an Arnold or an Olga. There are lots of variations in our opinions that I haven't covered I've just given you a couple of oversimplified character sketches for two main reasons. And the first is this. The first is to help us to pause for a moment and evaluate ourselves. Within the church, throughout this pandemic, we've faced the really daunting challenge, this, this daunting challenge of having someone like Arnold doing ministry alongside someone like Olga in the same local church. And I wonder, how do you think the Arnolds and the Olgas have done? Or let's make it a little bit more personal. How have you and I done? At times, have you and I 
arrogantly presume that our understanding of the situation can possibly be incorrect biblically? At times, have you and I been harsh or impatient in the way we've communicated our understanding or our perspective? I wonder, have you and I failed to listen to others with a different perspective in order to understand? Or have we failed to listen to understand? Have we simply shut people out who disagree with us? And I wonder, when we interact with someone who professes to follow Christ yet disagrees with our opinion about masks or social distancing or vaccines, I wonder then, do we wrongly judge that person as necessarily unloving or unnecessarily not following Christ faithfully? At one time or another during this pandemic, I've sinned in all of these ways. And if you have too, then at times... What's happened is we've looked like the disunited world around us. But the second reason for my giving these two examples of Arnold and Olga is to answer this question. With the Lord's help, if this pandemic continues to drag on, how can you and I do better so that we become less disunited like the world and more like the Lord Jesus Christ? Part of the answer to this question can be found in Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 6. So let's turn there now. And I've I've titled this sermon, Live Worthily of the Calling You've Received. And the sermon has three points, the first being this, the what. The what of living worthily. We see this in verse 1. Picking it up there, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner or live in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, the first thing to notice about verse 1 is that Paul begins with the word therefore. And the word therefore is therefore the purpose of pointing back to everything Paul has just written, in this case, all of chapters 1 to 3. In chapters 1 to 3, Paul has explained who we were before God saved us. And Paul has written about how God saved us. And Paul has also written about who we are now as God's people. Then, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, what Paul does is he switches gears and he begins to tell us how we must live together as Christians. So when Paul says, therefore, chapter 4, verse 1, he means to say that on the basis of who God is and who we are as his people, as outlined in chapters 1 to 3, this, therefore, is how you and I must now live. So we do well to ask, well, what's in chapters 1 to 3? What is this therefore? What is this weight of the therefore that Paul has in mind here in chapter 4, verse 1? So let's think about this. Here's my summary of chapters 1 to 3. It's one paragraph. In chapter 2, skipping ahead a little bit, we're told that before God saved us, you and I were spiritually dead in our sins in which we once walked. We are following the course of this world by nature, children of wrath, under the wrath of God, like the rest of mankind. We're also told in chapter 2 that we were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And there was this, this hostility between us Gentiles and Jews. But we're also told how God saved us in chapters 1 to 3. In chapter 2, we're told that God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. (coughs) We've been saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and who was resurrected to life. 
And we're also told about who we now are as God's saved people. In chapter 2, we're told that whether Gentile or Jew, we have been saved. And if we've been saved, this hostility that once existed between Jews and Gentiles because of the religious and social, economic, and ethnic differences, that hostility has been taken away. Through the cross, we all have been reconciled and brought into one body. Through Christ, we all now have access in one spirit to the same Father in heaven. And we all are members of the one household of God. We all are joined together into the one body and the one temple in whom God by his spirit lives. So then turning back to chapter 4, verse 1, what God is saying to us through his apostle is this. Given the reality of these fundamental spiritual truths, this is how you and I must therefore live. Now, before Paul tells us how we must live, he shows us with his very own life how we must live. Paul himself is an example of what he's about to tell us to do in verse 1. So look there again with me. Paul writes in verse 1, I therefore... A prisoner of the Lord. Paul is a prisoner of the Lord as he's writing this. This is a remarkable statement when we consider that Paul was once a hater of the Lord Jesus Christ and a violent persecutor of the Lord's church. But when that was true of Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the gospel, called him out of that spiritual darkness and called him to himself. And the Lord Jesus appointed Paul to the office of apostleship, which was to be dedicated to serving the Gentiles with the word of God. If you look back for a moment, if you have your Bible open, and you look back to chapter 3, verse 1, you can see this for yourself. In chapter 3, verse 1, there Paul, who, bear in mind, is a Jew, writes that he is a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Paul is in prison ultimately because of his devotion to Jesus. That's, That's true. But he was in prison also because of his devotion to Jesus' body, the church. In Ephesus, which consisted mainly of Gentiles who were in many ways unlike him. Paul was in prison because of his commitment to serving and building up the body of Christ out of love for Christ. Paul would pay whatever it costs to serve the Gentiles, including imprisonment in Rome where he was in chains as he wrote this letter. Next then in verse 1, on the basis of the spiritual realities Paul has written about in chapters 1 to 3, Paul urges us to live like him and ultimately like Christ. Again in verse 1, Paul writes, I urge you to walk or to live in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Here through Paul, God is urging us, Christians, to live in such a way that our lives are consistent with the calling we've received. God is urging us to live our lives as Christians in such a way that our calling is honored. To put it yet another way, we are to to conduct ourselves in ways that genuinely saved Christians should live. In verse 1, when Paul refers to how we've been called, he's talking about that moment in time when God called us effectually by the gospel out of the spiritual darkness and into the light. Paul is talking about that moment when God called us from spiritual death to everlasting life. By calling, Paul is referring to that moment when God saved each of us, bringing us into his kingdom, into his household, and into his church, and into his temple. 
So Paul is urging us, he's imploring us, he's pleading with us to show by how we live that truly we have been called by God out of the darkness and into the light of the glory of Christ. Now this brings us to our second point, which I'm calling the how. The how of living worthily, which we see in verses 2 and 3. Next, Paul tells us how we must live in a manner worthy of our calling. And really, this is what the rest of Ephesians, the rest of this letter is all about. But in verses 2 and 3, Paul begins here. This is where he begins. Which really underscores the importance, the preeminence of what he's about to say. Look at verse 2. Speaking through Paul, hear hear really what God is saying to Grace Church today. Paul writes, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, not bearing with one another grudgingly, but bearing with one another in love, Eager to maintain or making every effort to maintain or keep or preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So again, this is the how of living in a manner worthy of the calling to which each of us has been called. To turn verses 2 and 3 on their head, when we live with one another, in ways marked by pride or harshness or impatience and bitterness, if ever we do that, we do not live in a manner that shows we've been called by God. And when we live in such a way that we're indifferent about the unity of the local church or um, we live in such a way that we're not eager to maintain the unity of the church, that we're not honoring the calling to which God has called us. But when we do verses 2 and 3, which I see all the time in this church, praise the Lord, the opposite will be true. So then let's consider positively what it looks like to obey verses 2 and 3. So let's bring back our fictitious, fictitious friends Arnold and Olga. Let's say these two belong, I wish I had a picture or like a cartoon character or a sketch or something. Arnold and Olga, let's say they, these two belong to the same local church. According to the beginning of verse 2, if they're going to live in a manner worthy of the calling each of them has received, then they must worship and serve God beside each other with all humility and gentleness. Humility and gentleness. Hmm. So let's say that one Sunday, Arnold is sitting beside Olga. And somehow, Arnold ends up saying, I am fed up with seeing Christians not obeying government restrictions. How can Christians be so unloving? What would a humble and gentle response from Olga look like? Humility and gentleness are, of course, Christian virtues that develop over time. Mainly as we saturate ourselves in the scriptures and the Holy Spirit works those scriptures in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, so that we become more humble and gentle like Christ. If Olga is humble in this moment, God help her, then she will have a low opinion of herself. She will remember that she entered the kingdom of God like a little child. And she will know that, like Arnold, she is a great sinner, but Christ is a great Savior. And if Olga is humble, then she will not think she has all the answers, or her understanding is absolutely flawless. 
And if Olga is humble, then her posture towards her brother Arnold will be that of a servant. God helping her, she will seek to count Arnold more significant than herself and put his interests ahead of her own. She will choose to listen carefully to Arnold to understand, and she will seek to serve him in such a way that he will grow in his relationship with Christ and become more conformed to Christ. So Olga might say this to Arnold. There's different ways to approach this. I think this is maybe one way I would approach this. Arnold, you're such a blockhead. No, I'm joking. (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) I'm just seeing if you're still awake. (laughs) Arnold, you sound distressed. (laughs) I'd like to understand, Arnold, why you're so distressed. Will you tell me more about how you've arrived at your conclusions? About the government? Which scriptures have you been thinking about? And if Olga is gentle like Jesus, God helping her, her tone will be kind and sincere. If Olga is gentle like Jesus, then if there is an opportunity for her to share her own convictions and her own interpretations of certain scriptures with Arnold, then she will do this not arrogantly or harshly or condescendingly. And if she's humble and gentle, then she will want ultimately really to work beside Arnold in that conversation, to grow in understanding and obedience to the one Christ out of their mutual love for this one Christ. Now, according to the end of verse 2, if Arnold and Olga are going to live in a manner worthy of the calling each of them has received, then they also must be patient, bearing with each other in love. So, let's say Olga is sitting beside Arnold on another Sunday. These two are really (laughs) struggling. Here's the next Sunday. Olga is sitting beside Arnold on another Sunday. And Olga, in a moment of frustration, says to Arnold, I'm so done with these masks. I'm so done with social distancing. If anyone thinks all these rules are good for us, then there must be something wrong with his relationship with Christ. What might it look like for Arnold to be patient with Olga, bearing with her in love? Again, patience is a, is a Christian virtue that it has to be cultivated over time. And the more closely we walk with the God of the Scriptures who is perfect in patience, the more we'll become patient like He is. God is patient with us, is He not, as we struggle with sin? God... God is patiently at work over time to transform us. God bears with us, does he not? God bears with us in all our sin, ever loving us, never forsaking us or leaving us. So patient, so always bearing with us. This is how Arnold must learn to live. He must be patient. He must be long-suffering with Olga, just as God is. And just as God has been with him. So for Arnold to be patient, I think he will be helped tremendously to remember that he and every other Christian are works of God in progress. Nobody becomes perfectly conformed to Jesus overnight. Transformation takes time. Unlearning sinful habits takes time. Learning the word takes time. Learning to walk as Christ walked takes time. So Arnold might say to Olga, you blockhead. No, (laughs) you sound frustrated. Can you tell me more about how you arrived at your conclusions? Which scriptures have you been thinking about lately that caused you to draw these conclusions? And you, you might say, I'm not sure that what you're saying agrees with the Bible. May I humbly suggest this scripture? 
Now, according to verse 3, if Arnold and Olga are going to live in a manner worthy of the calling each of them has received, they must be eager to maintain, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And really, maintaining the unity of the church, this has been the goal that Paul has had in mind this entire time. The unity of the church. Notice that Paul does not say that we are to create unity. Church unity is something that the Spirit created. When he baptized each of us into Christ. Instead, Paul says we are to maintain the unity in the bond of peace. In other words, we are to make the invisible unity that we all have in the Holy Spirit visible by the way we live with one another. When we seek to live peacefully with one another, the invisible spiritual reality will become visible. So what's involved, I wonder, in maintaining the unity of the church? For sure, part of the answer is doing verses 1 and 2, which we just looked at. But at root, maintaining the unity of the church involves helping one another to keep focused on Christ, the chief shepherd of this church. And at root, maintaining the unity of the church involves being committed to our growing in our knowledge and our obedience to the scriptures so we become more like Christ. And maintaining the unity of the church also involves understanding, believing, acting upon the spiritual oneness we have as Christians, which brings us to our final point. I'm calling this the why the why of living worthily. In verses 4 to 6, God, speaking through Paul, tells us why living worthily of the calling we've received must involve our eagerly maintaining the unity of the church. Picking it up in verse, in verse 4, Paul writes, There is one body, one spirit, just as you recall to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So why, why must each of us make every effort to maintain the unity of Grace Church? Here the answer is, if we're not, then we're found to be opposing God who created the oneness of his church. Working our way down from verse 4, if you look there with me, we see that each of us Christians belongs to the one body of Christ, having been called effectually by the one Spirit, into the one hope that we share concerning the future return of Christ and the glories that will follow. Verse 5, each of us has the one Lord who died and was raised for us all. Each of us Christians believes in the one faith that is the core doctrine of biblical Christianity. Each of us, Paul continues, has received the one and the same baptism, having been baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ the moment each of us was saved. And verse 6, each of us Christians has one and the same Father in heaven who rules over all of us and who is at work through all of us and in all of us for our good, together for his glory. What oneness. Back in chapter 1, verse 10, Paul wrote that God's plan, God's plan is to unite all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. God's plan is to unite all things in heaven and on earth in in Christ. Today, our world is disunited, but a time will soon dawn when everything, everything will be united in Christ. This will be fully realized once Christ has returned and the glories follow. In the meantime, in this very hour, God intends for Grace Church to be a, a foretaste or a, a small picture of the fullness of that future cosmic 
unity. As a church, we, I think I was saying this to someone last Sunday after the service, as a church, we have an incredible opportunity in this hour to show God's good alternative to this increasingly disunited world. Massive opportunity here. We all have different spiritual gifts, different vocations, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different political perspectives, different upbringings, and different opinions on the pandemic. But what we have in common is infinitely more important, infinitely more valuable, which is that the one and the same Trinitarian God has called us out of the darkness and into the light, and this same and one God is now caring for us, and this same and one God will soon return for us and bring us home. And if, with all of our differences, you and I keep on choosing to live a life worthy of the calling we've received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, then we will help the disunited world around us to see the glory of the goodness of the God who unites us, that they may be drawn to Christ and saved. Tremendous opportunity to shine like lights on a dark night.